basket will be in Matthew chapter 9, and we'll be reading verses 9 through 13. Come, brother, and read, and then pray for the invocation. As he said, we're reading Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this time in your house to come and worship and praise you, Father. We thank you for the music. And Father, and now as we come to this time for our message, Father, we ask you to be with Pastor Chris, Father. Hide him behind the cross. Speak to him and through him, Father. Give him the words to say. And I ask that each and every one here Open their hearts and minds and take the message to heart so that we may go out into this lost and dying world and be great examples of Christians for you. Father, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you, and we ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. I thoroughly enjoy studying the book of Matthew. Now, many of you may not know, some of you may know, and I've mentioned it before, Matthew was a Jew who was a tax collector. Being a Jewish tax collector, he was shunned by his own people. The Jewish people did not like Matthew because tax collectors at that time would tell you what tax you owed. You had no idea they would let you know and they would tell you that you owed more than you actually did, and they would pocket the extra. That's how they made the majority of their money. So Matthew was not very liked amongst his own people. Now, Matthew's name really wasn't Matthew. How many of y'all knew that? Matthew's name was Levi. Matthew's name was Levi. If you'll remember, the Levites were priests. So he did a complete 180 from his namesake. He was not a priest of God. He was a tax collector for the Roman government. And Jesus chose this man to follow him. As Levi was setting and collecting taxes, Jesus came by, looked at him, and said, follow me. Now, Levi didn't really have much incentive to get up and follow Jesus. He had a good paying job. He had Roman guards that helped protect him. He didn't have to worry about the attacks from the Jewish people as long as he had the Roman guards. But to get up and follow Jesus, man, he lost that protection from the Romans. He lost worldly protection to follow Jesus. Folks, many of us face that same thing when we decide to follow Jesus. We have people in our lives, our friends, our family, some co-workers that will shun us because we decide to follow Jesus. So it was a big deal for Matthew to get up and follow him. Now, when we read the book of Matthew, Jesus changed Levi's name to Matthew, and Matthew meant gift from Yahweh. Jesus recognized that Matthew was going to be instrumental in helping to spread the gospel. The book of Matthew contains a lot of detailed information about Jesus' ministry because Matthew, even though he was shunned by the Jews, he wanted the Jewish people to come to know Jesus Christ. He actually loved his 
fellow Israelites and wanted them to come to know Jesus Christ. So the first thing I want us to look at is Matthew wanted his lost friends to meet Jesus. We read that Jesus was reclining at the table in the house with other tax collectors, or publicans as it's called in the King James, and sinners. And I just want to remind you that Scripture teaches us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I said something this morning about Jesus eating with sinners, and someone said, oh, we don't do that. And my reply to that was, well, if we don't, we're all going to starve to death. <laughs> Every time we sat down to eat with someone else, we're, we're eating with sinners. Just wanted to remind us of that. But there's a difference between the lost sinner and the saved saint. For see, when we come to know Jesus and we're washed in the blood, we're no longer as seen as sinners in the eyes of God, but we're seen as righteous. But Matthew wanted his friends to have the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ. Matthew, it doesn't spell this out, but you have to use some of your imagination. Matthew got up, left his post as a tax collector, went to follow Jesus, and he was so excited, he said, Jesus, please come to my house tonight. Let me feed you supper. I want you to meet some of my friends. Matthew had evidently seen Jesus in action, had seen some of the miracles, had heard some of the preaching. He knew what Jesus was about. And he wanted his friends to get to know Jesus, just like he got to know Jesus. See, once you know Jesus, and I'm not talking about know about Jesus, I'm not talking about hearing a sermon, I'm talking about knowing Jesus in your heart. When you know who Jesus is and what He did for you, you should want your friends to meet Him as well. You see, the problem with church today, and many people would say, well, the future of the church is the youth. If you don't have young people in your church, you don't have much of a future. you got to have youth in your church. Now, I love the youth in our church. I love young people coming to church. I love seeing children in church. Folks, I love it when I hear them running and screaming and playing and having a good time because I know that they've been learning about Jesus and they're excited. I tell you, nothing better than hearing a young person telling their friends about going to church and knowing Jesus. Many of us need to have that childlike uh, exuberance when we deal with our friends. Just like Matthew did, we should want our friends to come to know Jesus. Now, we don't go put ourselves in the midst of publicans and sinners on the off chance that Jesus might show up. No, we got to have Jesus with us. We got to be prepared to present Jesus to them, and then we don't stick around. Every time you read an account of Jesus having an interaction with a sinner, he doesn't hang around. Them. He shows up, tells them the truth, and then he goes on his way. So we need to be careful. We don't go sit at a bar and bend our elbow with other alcoholics claiming that we're doing it in the name of Jesus. Now there's nothing wrong with being in a place and leaving a track or being in a place and telling someone about Jesus, but we don't settle in and make that our regular place to go. Otherwise we will fall into the trap that Satan has set for us. We need to be careful of that but yet we still want our lost friends to know Jesus. And when Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees, one of the things that we must understand is the Pharisees didn't know they were lost. Jesus tells them that well people don't need a physician. Those who are righteous don't need salvation. When in fact we know and Jesus knew that all were in the need of salvation, even the very Pharisees that he was addressing. The Pharisees didn't know they were lost. They were pious and they thought they were righteous enough because they were Jewish and because they followed the rules. You see, 
many churches can set down a list of rules for you to follow. And you can follow them. But if you don't know Jesus in your heart, you're not saved. You're just a lost person following rules. We must understand the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus first. See, many people today will refuse the lordship of Jesus, thinking that simply because they go to church and they try to be good enough, just like the Pharisees, that they're okay. They refuse to see the truth. There are many churches today that are filled with well-meaning people seeking out Jesus, but in fact, Scripture tells us that nobody seeks Jesus. Nobody. Jesus is the seeker. If you're here today and you're saved, it's because God sought you out and put someone in your life to tell you about Jesus. So as you're eating your dinner and you're sitting with sinners, make sure that they know that you know Jesus. Make sure that they know that they're lost and they need Jesus in order to gain salvation. Because see, if we're not careful, we'll be just like the Pharisees and we'll look down on those who don't seem righteous enough. We're all guilty of doing it. We're all guilty of prejudging people and looking at them and saving the salvation that we enjoy because they're not worth it. That person doesn't want to hear about Jesus. That person doesn't need to know Jesus. Why, why that person, I, I don't want someone like that coming to my church. Folks, we should want everybody to come to our church, no matter how they're dressed or what they look like, the color of their skin or what kind of lifestyle they practice. They're more than welcome to sit in here and hear the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come as you are. But folks, he doesn't expect you to leave in the same condition that you show up in. We should all be changed by coming to know Jesus, just like Levi the tax collector. We should all seek that name change. And folks, we all get a name change when we come to know Jesus Christ. We are known as Christian. We call each other brother and sister when we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And even though the Pharisees were a brood of vipers who were more concerned with following rules and knowing Scripture, Jesus still did not exclude them from hearing the truth. There's one Pharisee that actually sought Jesus out. In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we read that there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform these signs that you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, the very Pharisees that rejected Jesus and wanted him hung on the cross recognized that the only power Jesus possessed came from God. They knew this, and yet they still rejected Him. Many today are doing the same thing. They're practicing a form of godliness and denying the power therein. Many people sitting in church today recognize God, recognize Jesus Christ, but they do not make themselves available to the power that the Holy Spirit possesses because they don't want their lives disrupted by this very same Jesus that brought a tax collector out from behind his booth and turned him into Matthew. Many people today continue to reject Jesus Christ because they don't want to give up their power and prestige and their money. See, Nicodemus realized there was something about Jesus that he needed. But he sought Jesus out under the darkness of night. There are many here today 
who are seeking out Jesus, but they don't want people to know that they have sin in their life. They don't want people to know that they're lost. There are people who have professed to be Christians for years and walk around lost because they're too ashamed to admit in front of other people that they really don't know Jesus as their Lord. Many people come to church and put on a good face and say hallelujah at the right time, even though Monday through Saturday they're living like hell and holding hands with the devil. When Jesus wants you to have supper with Him every day. God wants you to talk to Him every day. But see, just like Nicodemus thought he was good enough because he was a Jew and he was following rules, he knew that he needed something more than that. There's people out there today that think that they're good. And what do we put that up against? Well, I'm better than this guy because I don't do what he does. I'm better than this guy because I go to church. I'm better than them because I go to Sunday school. I'm better than these people because I tithe. I'm better than this person because I do this, that, or the other. Folks, you're no better than Adolf Hitler when it comes to the eyes of God and the sin that's in your life. You're just as lost as the most wretched criminal and murderer there is out there. Unless you have the blood of Jesus that covers you and shows you as righteous to the eyes of God. Nicodemus, even though he heard these words, you must be born again. His mind immediately went to, how can I do that? I can't go back to my mother and go back to the womb and come back out again. Jesus makes it clear that in order to be born again, we come out a different person. Matthew was Levi until he came to know Jesus. Paul persecuted Christians in the name of God until he came to know Jesus and became Saul. Folks, we all need that change. We all need to be changed by Jesus Christ. And the third thing that we'll look at Yes, God wants your obedience. Yes, your pastor wants your obedience. You should want to be obedient to the one who gives life and the one who granted salvation through His own blood. But folks, you're not going to enjoy the benefits of obedience until you give God your heart. God doesn't necessarily want your attendance. God doesn't necessarily want your money. God doesn't necessarily want anything from you until you give Him your heart. We read that Jesus told them that He didn't necessarily require their sacrifice. We read in there, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's in verse 13. That is also listed in the book of Hosea. Chapter 6 and verse 6. God Himself says, I desire faithful love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God doesn't care how devoted you are to coming to church. God cares that you have given Him your heart. See, when you give God your heart, He changes it because our heart is deceptive and wicked. Our heart wants what the heart wants. You've heard the saying, follow the desires of your heart. That is the worst advice that you could ever give anybody because your heart is deceptive, it's wicked, and it's selfish. You see, the world will tell you, look out for number one. Do what's best for you. Jesus said, deny yourself and love your neighbor. Give up your comfort so someone else can be comfortable. Jesus displayed that when He went to the cross. See, Jesus did not have to die for your sins. He willingly died for your sins so that you could enjoy salvation, so that you could be comfortable for eternity. God had every right to look down on His creation just like He did in the days of Noah 
and say, I'm fed up with these people. All they know is sin. All they want to do is deny me and go against my word. I'm done with them. God has every right to do that today. And there's coming a day when God says, enough. The word's been preached. The invitation's been given. All those who deny me now will no longer have a chance. That day is coming. While we still have an opportunity to sit down and dine with sinners, we need to be about the work of the Lord. We need to be like Matthew and be excited that we have salvation through the blood of Jesus. We need to look at our neighbors and our co-workers and our family. And we need to be grieved because they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Just like God. David was a man after God's own heart. In which way? That he wanted the very desires that God wanted. What does God desire? That all should come to repentance and salvation. That none should be destroyed. We should have that same heart. We should have that same attitude. Once you give God your heart. Your obedience and sacrifice will come naturally to you. It won't bother you to write out your tithe check. It won't bother you to give extra to the building fund. It won't bother you to give money uh, to the benevolence fund. It won't bother you to give up a Saturday and come to a men's breakfast. It won't bother you to give up a Saturday and help a church member move. It won't bother you to go out of your way to make sure someone else is comfortable. But until you give God your heart and He makes that change, you're going to be thinking of yourself. Well, I'm not going to church today. I'm going to be comfortable at home. I've worked hard all week and I don't feel like going out there. I don't want to go to church on Wednesday night. I've worked hard all day and I want to sit in my recliner and watch TV. I don't want to come Sunday night because I think my question is going to be stupid and I don't want to ask it. Folks, your question is not stupid. The only stupid question is the one that doesn't get asked. The reason you're in church today is because God wanted you to be here so you could learn something. The only reason you go to Sunday school is because God wants you to be there so you can learn something. But every time you refuse to gather with God's people, you're telling God, I don't need your word. I don't know how many of you do daily devotions. But I just finished a, a study on bivocational pastors through the seminary. And one of the things the instructor presented to us was the most important thing in a pastor's life is not sermon preparation. It's not preaching on Sunday morning. It's not necessarily caring for the congregation. He presented that the most important thing in a pastor's life is the same that's most important in any Christian man's life is that number one, you do daily devotions. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you honestly do a daily devotion? Number two is to do family devotions daily. Turn off the Wi-Fi in your house and your children will seek you out. Change the password and your family will seek you out. And take that time to do a devotion with them. Married men, how often do you do a devotion with your wife? Not the two of you sitting in the same room doing your separate devotions but coming together as a couple and doing a devotion together daily and praying with your spouse daily. I don't mind telling you, I fail at that very thing because life gets busy and I make excuses, but the truth is there is no excuse. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. We all must make the time to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. 
the good news is if you do all three of these things, God will provide. I don't care what it is, He'll provide it. I don't care what you need in your life, He will provide it. Jesus provided to Abraham a ram to sacrifice in place of his son. How many of us are sacrificing our sons and daughters for our own selfishness? When God has already given us the sacrifice, we just got to make use of it. When we fully realize what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary, it should be a no-brainer for us to sacrifice some time to Him. We must give of ourselves in order to reap the rewards of following Jesus Christ. The world today would love to tell you that it's just as easy as believing in the name of Jesus Christ. And many of us love that message. But the truth is, God is a jealous God. Whatever's in your life that is keeping you from obeying Him, He will take it out. So we must be diligent and give our heart to God so that He can change it and make us the person that He wants us to be. We're just like Matthew. Until we decide to get up and follow Jesus, we're dirty, rotten, filthy, lost sinners. And the truth is, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But also, the wrath of God will be poured out on the unrighteous on His day, on the day of reckoning. There will be fire and brimstone in some people's lives because they refuse to get up from their post and follow Jesus, just like he called Matthew to do. So today, you have a choice to make. You're either going to continue working for the Roman government and following the world, or you're going to get up and follow Jesus and have your name changed and enjoy the salvation that comes through obedience to our Lord and our Savior. If you're here today and Jesus is not your Lord, today is the day you make that decision. If you're here today and you have no idea who this Jesus person is, but you'd like to get to know him, I would love to sit down and have supper with you and introduce you to the man that saved me. And many of us must have that very same attitude. You see, the church ceases to grow not because we don't have youth in the building, but because those of us who are called Christians aren't inviting our peers to come to church. You know, I would love for Tall Pines to be a young person's church, but maybe God doesn't have that in His plans for us. Maybe we're a middle-aged to an older person church. Maybe we'll experience growth when we decide that we're going to invite our friends to know Jesus. So today, as you decide what you're going to do with this Jesus that has called you to follow Him, you're either going to be like Levi and follow Him and have your name changed, or you're going to be like the rich young ruler and you're going to walk away sad because you're not willing to give up the thing that you love the most in order to follow Jesus. And that is different for all of us. But folks, if you haven't changed from the way you were before you met Jesus, you're not saved. Scripture teaches us that we become a brand new creation. Jesus himself said that we must be born again. So you can know that you know you're following Jesus. You're not the same person you were years ago before you met. So as you do business with the Holy Spirit, this altar will be open. The invitation is that you come to know Jesus. I'll be up here to receive you and pray with you. But you need to decide in your heart to do business with God. As we sing this song of invitation, 
and realizing that time will run out one day. 